10th, 2013, Rainbow Rowell publishes a book called Fangirl in which a girl named Kath writes fanfiction for a wildly popular series about a chosen one attending Wizarding British Boarding School. This fanfiction is mostly about the non-canon but most popular enemies to lovers ship, Drary. Wait, no, 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 I'm not talking about Harry Potter. I'm talking about the Simon Snow series, the author's fake fictional series with its own magic system, rules, and characters that's still a clear meta text on what I'll refer to as the golden age of Harry Potter fandom. Fangirl does well in the contemporary space but doesn't garner too much attention outside of it until October 6, 2015, when Rainbow Rowell publishes Carry On, a book about the fake series Kath wrote fanfiction for in Fangirl. It exists in a sort of nebulous space where it's not canonical to the story that Kath was writing fanfiction for, and it's not the fanfiction that Kath was writing. It's Rainbow Rowell's own exploration of the story that she made up to write Fangirl. And it too is an overt meta text on Harry Potter, though not the golden age, but I'll get to that in a second. Carry On received a lot of critical acclaim across the entire book sphere. People who loved Harry Potter in their childhood liked the nuanced discussions of topics Harry Potter treated as black and white. People who hadn't read Harry Potter found a lot of familiarity just in Carry On's use and subversion of popular tropes from the 2000 and 2010s. On top of that, it was just a really fun book that still managed to deal with heavy topics like trauma and the impacts of being a child soldier. And of course, it had a canon queer couple, Simon and Baz. There was a lot to love. Being so widely talked about and with a canon male-male couple, Snow Baz, that's their ship name, quickly amassed its own little fandom, mostly on Tumblr and AO3. While the book was hugely successful, the actual fandom remained small, mostly due to there only being one and a half books. Half, because while Fangirl does have some Snowbats content, none of it is considered canon. And at the time, there was no expectation for a sequel. Until in June 2018, when Rainbow Rowell announced there would be a Carry On sequel and the fandom space started making posts of things they wanted to see, their predictions, expectations, etc. And let's just say that when Wayward Sun was released, certain fans were less than happy. But before we get into exactly what went down, I want to really quickly explain what I'm calling the golden and silver ages of the Harry Potter fandom for context. So, the golden age of the Harry Potter fandom starts in 2000, right after the release of the Goblet of Fire with the kickoff of the three-year summer. This is the three-year gap between the release of the fourth and fifth books, and this period of hiatus brain was some of the most prolific content creation among fans, taking place across a highly stratified online landscape. While fanfiction.net did exist, most fanfic writing took place in lots of little independent fan-run sites. These were often hard to find or gain access to, and some even required passwords. The golden age of the Harry Potter fandom did a lot to bring fanfiction and fan art into the public sphere, but we weren't there yet. LiveJournal was by far the easiest to access, and while it didn't host the majority of fanfiction, personal blogs of famous fanfic writers, archives, and discussions took place here, and it became something of a hub in the Golden Age. IRL, there was massive amounts of fan activity too, stuff like Harry Potter bands, homespun camps, this is before the Wizarding World parks, conventions, even Quidditch matches. If you name something from the early 2000s, there was probably a Harry Potter equivalent. After the release of The Order of the Phoenix, the Harry Potter fandom slowed down a little, but mostly stayed the same until 2007 with the release of Deathly Hollows. Fans now had all the canon events of the story to discuss and make fan content for. This marked the beginning of a major tone shift. In August the same year, LiveJournal changed its policies overnight and fans woke up the next morning to find there'd been a massive purge of Harry Potter blogs, and after a period of anger and confusion, they migrated away. This starts the silver age of the Harry Potter fandom, and the first of it actually happens in February. I'm sorry, fandom stuff can get messy. In February, the first version of Tumblr.com was launched, and while it wasn't relevant to the golden age since it happened right at the end and people were still using LiveJournal, once LiveJournal went away, Tumblr replaced it as kind of the fandom hub. Next, in 2008, Archive of Our Own was created, usually referred to as AO3 in the fandom spaces but it doesn't become a public beta until 2009. Fanfiction at this point is becoming localized on major fanfiction sites instead of scattered across the internet. 
In 2011, the last Harry Potter movie is released and the world starts moving away from the Harry Potter phenomenon even though the fandom still stayed strong through to the release of The Cursed Child. Although people were leaving at this point, people are leaving kind of throughout the entirety of the Silver Age and past it. Okay. <laughs> The Silver Age saw a lot of critical discussions, remixes, and fan theories, all things that were happening in the Golden Age, but the tone was shifting. J.K. Rowling was now starting to see bigger critique within the fandom, especially queer spaces, but it wasn't widespread until the end of the Silver Age, and didn't reach mass media attention until 2020, apparently. After 2016, the fandom became messy, often inconsistent and aggressive, as fans who remained started dealing with their frustration over J.K. Rowling especially with the release of Fan the Fantastic Beasts series. But honestly, aside from Harry Potter still being a big part of the internet, it's not terribly relevant to the carry-on fandom anymore. Although it did kind of have a bit of a renaissance recently, which is exciting, but all the old fandoms are having renaissances now. <laughs> okay, Fangirl. While Fangirl was released in 2013, solidly in the Silver Age, it's attending to the Golden Age of the fandom. Kath is writing an alternate into the series that she hopes to finish before the last book comes out, so the timeline is in that range. But Kath also has a sort of pure admiration for J.K. Rowling's stand-in. This is a facet that only really existed in any universal since during the Golden Age. Two years later, when Carry On is released, the books are no longer attending to the Golden Age. Carry On isn't a direct metatext on the Harry Potter fandom, but the attitudes reflected in the book are a lot more critical, especially of the Harry Potter epilogue. There is a definitive tone shift, which is partially because Rainbow Rowell isn't attempting to perfectly match the narrative tone of Harry Potter so much as subvert and play with its tropes as a means to discuss trauma. Carry On also reflects the Silver Age more, since a lot of disheartened Harry Potter fans join the Carry On fandom, seeing it as a more welcoming space. So Rainbow Rowell writes a book with fun, snappy prose written through a lot of different perspectives that's highly derivative on purpose. I'm not saying it's derivative as an insult, its world is derivative, but the characters behave like real people, and she's trying to do something with that. The book's use of multiple POV allows it to really dig into a lot of different moral discussions from different angles. The people recommending and discussing the book are very interested in these conversations. You might think that the fandom for a book like this would be really interested in all those nuanced discussions. It's unfair to say that none of that was happening. There was a lot of discussion of the mage frequently as a means to Dumbledore bash. And fans generally loved that Simon ends up in therapy, but it's Tumblr and they're a gay ship. There's a lot of fluff, there's a lot of AU fix, specifically a lot of Hogwarts AUs. Now, at this period, no fandom is able to escape without at least one Hogwarts AU, but Carry On does fit very neatly. There's also a lot of drawings of Simon and Baz hugging, kissing, or favorite scenes from the books. There's also a great deal of loose canon within the books. Rainbow Rowell doesn't tell you anything about the world that's not relevant, and that leaves a lot of space for interpretation, along with the fact that, remember, we still have Fangirl, which has a lot of information about the Snowbaz world without really being canon. The fandom starts making a lot of fanon, which is fan canon in this instance, not if it's strictly non-canon, which creates an environment where everybody tends to agree with each other. The fandom space is pleasant, welcoming, and generally in agreement, which is very nice for a lot of people leaving the Silver Age of the Harry Potter fandom, which is not at this point. <laughs> fandom spaces generally have more ship content than in-depth discussions about heavy issues in the media, and with four years of only one supposed standalone book, the conversation steadily turned from the book to Snowbaz. We should also note that the general fandom space online at this point, roughly speaking from 2015 to 2020, though there's a lot of changes, changes happening in between, this is very, very broad, but Tumblr is the hub, not just for specific fandoms, but for all fandoms, and fanfiction.net is still around, but slowly getting replaced with AO3 as the new gold standard of fanfic websites. Wattpad's also around, but not relevant to this video. 
Having these conglomerations of sites means that it's easy to access multi-fandom content, and in fact on Tumblr it's more common to see multi-fandom blogs than one fandom blogs. This is especially true for a fandom like Carry On, which is small and only has one and a half books. This multi-fandom style leads to a lot of interchangeability between characters with certain dynamics. It's a Tumblr joke that there's too many ships with blonde haired and black haired boys or himbo boys and snarky boys and everyone gets them confused. People who basically saw Snowbaz as Can and Drary, not an incorrect assumption on their part, started to shift the conversation from trauma responses and the specifics of Snowbaz into kind of an amalgamation of all the cute gay boys. With everyone in the Carry On fandom having a lot of freedom over the content and years to theorize about what Simon and Baz did after the books, a generally pleasant and cohesive space, and a degree of interchangeability between Snow Baz and their other favorite ships, it's not surprising that the tone of Carry On slipped away from a few fans. One last thing, before anyone blames straight girls for fetishizing gay men, the Carry On fandom was largely a queer space. I'm not saying there weren't straight people in it, but most of the fandom was queer. We can't blame the straights, folks. We did this to ourselves. The Wait for Wayward Son. So, January 2018, a post titled Rainbow Rowell is writing a Carry On sequel, a very plausible theory made by the user Empty Hearse. Hello, Sherlock fandom starts making its way around the Carry On fandom. It gets a lot of positive responses, even people who don't believe it find the post to be exciting to discuss. Because what would a Carry On sequel look like? The empty hearse continues to update the post infrequently, mostly compiling tweets by Rainbow Rowell with the occasional interview answers thrown in. There are murmurs and Rainbow Rowell does some minor teasing with fans saying stuff like, reply Hazy please try again when fans ask about a sequel and mentioning that she has a few secret projects. However, fans aren't willing to be fully on board with the theory yet, mostly because Rainbow Rowell also works with Marvel, so a secret project could just be that. Well, in June 2018, Rainbow Rowell does announce the sequel, promising she'll give more details when she's able. Soon enough, a title and poster comes out. For a bit, the fandom just loses their minds over Baz's suit. He looks like Harry Styles. Posts are flooding everyone's dashboards. Then, then the first Baz Looks Radiant posts start. They compare how Baz looked on the paperback copy of Carry On with how he looks on the poster for Wayward Son. A snack. He looks like a floral snack is the fandom's consensus. And no one who looks that much like a snack and wears amazing floral suits can be sad. Look at his glow up. Energy is running high and fans aren't thinking about how the characters were doing at the end of Carry On, they're too focused on the four years of fluff fix. When the fandom learns that Baz, Simon, and Penny are going to America, everyone's convinced it's going to be a cute, fun road trip. There are a few posts being made about how Simon was depressed at the end of the last book, but the responses to those are largely, Simon has a therapist and a hot vampire boyfriend. He looks happy on the poster. He looks happy on the poster. April 2018, Rainbow Rowell releases the first line of Wayward Sun, which is Simon Snow is laying on the sofa. There's a flood of posts about how Simon is sad, fan art of Simon laying on the couch, looking sad with Penny and Baz looking concerned. Fandom definitely starts breaking up into fans who still think there's going to be a lot of fluff and fans who think there's going to be primarily angst. But a lot of the damage, as far as people speculating about the new book and what's happened to the characters in the meantime, has been done. Regardless of the canon events carry on, there's a certain expectation of cute gay content for Wayward Son. And a fun American road trip and crazy shenanigans. Well, September 24th, 2019 hits and immediately there's a huge divide between fans who did like the book and fans who didn't. Some fans feel angry because yes, Wayward Son ended up being an angst deep bug, where Simon and Baz suffer communication issues, a breakup hangs over their head for the entire book, Simon is depressed and has major touch aversion issues, Baz is insecure and responding to Simon pushing him away by becoming distant and not knowing how to tell Simon how he feels. To put it short, Snow Baz are not a fluffy power couple. One-star reviews panning the books go up on Goodreads, dashboards are flooded with Wayward Sun complaints, Rainbow Rowell 
response to people saying they've purchased multiple copies of Wayward Son on Twitter by saying she really hopes that they like it, since it's been clear for a while that the expectations of the fan base and the content of the books won't line up. And I just have to say, so the sequel to a book about traumatized child soldiers where the main character was literally disfigured by his magic then had to sacrifice his magic thereby becoming locked out of the world he loves and belongs in and no longer belonging in the normal world due to his literal dragon parts which he can't get rid of by himself, feels powerless and trapped. The sequel to that, being angsty and about those characters struggling with mental health issues, is shockingly not a fluffy romp across America. What a twist that the couple who previously punched each other down flights of stairs and antagonized each other because they didn't know how to talk about their feelings can't properly communicate their feelings and end up pushing each other away. Okay, I'm done. I've got out of my system. Why did so many fans just like Wayward Son? You might already know some of the issues from how fans responded to the wait for Wayward Son, but to me there's five key reasons. The fandom's derailment from the source material brought on in large part due to the long wait between books with no sequel expectation, high fan control of the content, inherent struggles with trauma representation in books, and backing up feelings with facts and takedown culture. The first three reasons are pretty well discussed in the overview of Carry On's fandom and the wait for Wayward Son, and together they make up the overall problem of fan expectations being difficult to encompass whenever there's a long wait, and there's a certain discussion about whether an unplanned sequel can ever be truly good. I would say yes, especially if the first story leaves a lot of unresolved issues. Wayward Son has a lot of work to do catching the reader up on what Simon, Baz, and Penny, and Agatha have been doing since the last book, readdressing issues and bringing up new issues for the plot of Wayward Son, as well as the last book in the Now trilogy. I'm not going to pretend it's not a difficult thing to do. Or that Wayward Son necessarily did it perfectly. You don't have to do something perfectly to be good. The feeling of high fan control over Carry On's content is once again due to the long wait and lack of expectation for a sequel. It can be really hard when an author reasserts their control over texts that fans have since put a lot of personal thought into, discussions of which opinion, the author or the readers, come up and there's never an easy answer. The author owns the rights and they can do whatever they want with the series. I'm hesitant to just discount the reader. I personally feel like the Cursed Child is a scourge upon the Harry Potter books. and. I pretend it doesn't exist, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't within J.K. Rowling's right to write it. Ultimately, if you dislike Wayward Son or you don't feel like handing control back to the author, you don't have to read it. But you should examine the root of why you feel the book doesn't belong. Is it really because Wayward Son is totally unlike Carry On, or have you misinterpreted the tone of Carry On in the first place? Discussions of trauma in YA. Any book that discusses trauma is going to have a lot of critical thought on it. Trauma is complicated and nuanced and there's no one way to represent it. Just because you share the same trauma with somebody doesn't mean that you have the same reaction to it. More than that, misinterpreting mental health issues can lead to real harm on already stigmatized groups. Some fans felt like the trauma in Wayward Son wasn't a genuine representation or if it was, Rainbow Rowell was just using the trauma to drag the plot along. Interestingly, when The Order of the Phoenix was released in 2003, a lot of fans complained that the book dragged on and Harry was too angsty and depressed the whole time, that Harry should have talked with his friends and essentially stopped being a melodramatic teenager. Harry's 15 in that book and he's been isolated all summer after watching somebody die and being tortured by a 50-year-old man who wants to murder him for reasons that aren't being explained to him. I bring this up because characters being affected by and therefore not performing perfectly as heroes has been critiqued before as frustrating and ruining a fun book. There's a few ways to discuss trauma. One comes from the POV of an expert. As far as I know, Rainbow Rowell does not. However, she has said that she's trying to work through her own issues and feelings through the book. And while you can mess up, even with good intentions, it's clear that Rainbow Rowell made a good faith attempt at representing genuine trauma. The actual trauma in the book, in my opinion, is handled well. Not everyone is going to share the same trauma responses, but the book doesn't perpetuate negative stereotypes. Simon's depression is a legitimate struggle for him and his insecurities stem from realistic problems that happened during Carry On. It's not out of the blue. Yes, there's a lot of communication issues between Simon and Baz, but they aren't things that are necessarily easy to work out, i.e. not useless miscommunication. Both Simon and Baz are in a place of deep insecurity and self-doubt. 
Sure, theoretically, if they sat down and said everything they were feeling, their problems would be solved. But it's really hard in real life to tell somebody who you think is about to break up with you that you love them. Simon has to stop once in the middle of making out with Baz because he feels like they're going farther than he's comfortable and he doesn't know why or how to communicate this. Baz feels hurt by this and by Simon continuing to be unable to touch him. Simon feels a lack of control over his own body and much of his power and self-worth has been taken away from him by the events of the last book. Once again, he is literally disfigured by magic. He can't go in public without somebody else spelling his wings invisible. None of the conversations they need to have are easy, and both of them have proved in Carry On that they're very bad at talking. I mean, in Carry On, Simon asks to be Baz's bad boyfriend and says that he's never been good at being Agatha's boyfriend and he'll probably mess up with Baz. Then in Wayward Son, he does. Backing up feelings with facts and takedown culture. Fans were frustrated, that's understandable, but there are issues with immediately responding with harsh rhetoric when it's based on feelings. I've pulled some comments from a couple of reviews made right after Wayward Son's release. The first review is one star, it's made on the release date. Simon impulsively kissing Baz right after the first vampire fight? Hell yeah, but give me more than a few lines, especially when it's been who knows how long since they've last kissed. That moment could have been huge, but it was just glossed over like everything else, making it forgettable in the end. So yes, there's not a ton of Simon and Baz kissing because they're having relationship issues and Simon has a certain degree of touch aversion because of his trauma. This is from another review, two stars this time. The reviewer says the book wasn't for them, but isn't claiming it's trash. The statement is really illustrative of the mood surrounding Snow Baz. The book is just so incredibly different to carry on. The tone in carry on is fun, fluffy, and it doesn't take itself too seriously. Whereas in Wayward Son, the tone completely shifts to a more serious tone with the characters going through their own struggles. Carry on, fun, fluffy, and doesn't take itself too seriously. While carry on knows it's meta tech, it's still dealing with a lot of serious moments where it's clear the characters are troubled by the events. I mean, Baz sets a forest on fire with the intent of burning himself alive because his mother wouldn't have let him live if she'd known he was a vampire. That's pretty serious. There were also a lot of complaints that it read like fan fiction, something quite a few fans found charming about the first book. Yes, both Carry On and Wayward Son read a little like fan fiction. It worked for Carry On, but not for Wayward Son, mostly because Wayward Son had relationship issues. Simon and Baz were not performing a fluffy queer relationship for the enjoyment of the reader. They were really struggling. They had a lot of legitimate issues brought on through their trauma. People don't like to say, this book was good, but I didn't like it. Instead of admitting to themselves that what they wanted out of Wayward Son was a cute gay relationship, they just criticized the book for doing what it's always done. It's okay not to like something. I'll be honest, I'm not a big fan of Wuthering Heights, but it'd be a little foolish of me to claim that Wuthering Heights is an objectively horrible, badly written book just because it's not my personal cup of tea. It's a very good book, I just don't like it. And it's all right not to like a sad, intense book, but that doesn't mean that the sad, intense book is inherently bad for being sad and intense. There's a culture online right now of backing up feelings with facts. This is all those, this show is garbage and here's why videos. Posts where people try to cite objective writing errors to explain why they feel a certain way about a book in an effort to get everyone to also dislike the thing they don't like. It's all absolutes. If you read Wayward Son and hated it, that feeling of disappointment or sadness or frustration is valid. But not liking something doesn't make it bad. And not liking what a book had doesn't mean that the book didn't meet the expectations that it laid out. Are there writing errors in Wayward Son? Yeah, there's mistakes in everything. No book is perfect. It's hard, however, for people to admit that something just wasn't for them. If you want precious gay boys and a power couple relationship, I have good news for you. There's a lot of male-male pairings, canon male-male pairings now, with big fandoms. Rainbow Rail does not owe you perfectly happy gay boys to kiss and have a fluffy romp across America. There's other books out there. Yeah, we're done. Did I make my point? Who knows? But we're done.